Okay. It looks like we are live. How is everyone doing today? What is up on this Tuesday? Hey, what's up, LaVon Hall? William Kendrex, first day on Periscope. Sport, sport or active. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you all. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, my name is Jason Levine. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And uh, for today's brief live stream, I'm going to be talking to you about how to create and set up a surround mixing session, a 5.1 session in Adobe Audition, which you can then share and use inside of Premiere Pro. So as always, thank you for joining us on YouTube, Periscope, and Facebook. What's up, Warangal Techro? How's it going? Uh, I will take questions towards the end because I want to kind of <laughs> get through this. What's up, William? Thank you very much for that comment. I want to try and get through this kind of just to show you the ins and outs of setting this up. It's actually really easy, and there's a couple of really simple things that you can do if you're wanting to create an interleaved file. In other words, um, an uncompressed wave, which you can uh, ultimately then use directly in Premiere, or if you have some kind of external encoder that you're wanting to encode via uh, um, Dolby or some other format for multi-channel surround playback, whether it's Atmos or anything like that, uh, you can do that as well. So, all right, just a quick couple of hellos here from Facebook, and then we're going to get moving. Trevor, Tim, what's up? Claudio, Christian from Denmark, nice to see you. Joyce, nice to see you as well. Shashi Kiran, hello. David Ham, all right. Thomas Benner, Austin, present. Very nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Peter Whiter, how are you? Jay Yunte, good afternoon. All right. 6 a.m. in Australia, Peter. Wow, you are uh, you are dedicated, my friend. And Warangal Techro from India, great. And CL Karine, Karine Brisa, and very nice to see you too. Apologies for my lackluster pronunciation if it wasn't uh, wasn't perfect. And it's very nice to see you, Levon, as well. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and switch over real quickly. Oh, and just because uh, I keep redoing kind of the camera setups here. So here's another one, uh, just so you can kind of see just directly behind me there. Uh, <laughs> so you can see uh, some custom sound panels, the uh, all of the bass traps going floor to ceiling here, and my surround speaker is actually behind me there. So that's if I were properly mixing surround as well as some amps and some of the studio gear that I've often referred to. So just another look, I'm trying to... <laughs> reconfig how you see things in here. At some point, it would kind of be cool to have one of these cams and something rotating so I could point to different sections, if you care. It's really just eye candy. Anyway, um, so I'm going to be working off of a session that I've used many times here on stream, just because I don't mix 5.1 that often. Oddly enough, I just got an ask recently from a production I did a long time ago to create a 5.1 version of it for some kind of DVD, DVD audio, DVD extras kind of thing, or Blu-ray extras. So um, I'm in the process of doing that, but I haven't really, I haven't gotten there quite yet. So we're just going to start with a, a session that I have here, but I'm going to show you first how you set the whole thing up. So just real quickly, Adobe Audition and Premiere both um, currently only support 5.1 mixing. Now you can create in Audition any numbered channeled files. So if you wanted to create from a series of stems, uh, for instance, a 7.1 file, an interleaved 7.1 file, or a 10.2 file, if you're going to be bringing it into an Atmos, uh, Atmos um, encoder, or anything, it could be a 32-channel file, you can build those files in Audition. You can create them, you can add stems and content to them, but you can't mix in anything but 5.1 at present. Kind of a bummer limitation, but that's just how it is. So we're going to focus on 5.1. So what I have here is this session uh, accompanying all the audio for this pseudo, uh, this fake movie trailer that we created a couple of years ago called Something's Happening. And um, if you just take a look, if I expand the tracks here, ultimately 5.1 mixing functions exactly the same as stereo mixing, except that you have access to a multi-channel panner. And if you double click on this multi-channel panner, it has a very nice little UI here. And this just kind of shows you, you know, the difference between mixing and stereo versus six channels, where, of course, not only can you move things around across the six speakers, but you have complete and total automation of how sound travels 
across and through all of those speakers, including independent control over LFE levels, center channel levels, and then the angle radius of everything in your surround, um, in your surround image. Live streaming. Live streaming. Close the door. See what play. Interruptions. It's life. School's out for summer, yo. Okay. So, uh, so we're going to be kind of focusing on the simplicity and the ease of automating movement and surround with this. Okay, so how do, you, how do you even get started? How do you begin doing this? All right, well, again, it's the same as creating a new session from scratch. If we go up to the File menu here and choose File New Multitrack Session, all right, it'll bring up your new session dialog, and we call this Surround Test, right? Tell it where you want it to go. Now, we have lots of templates to get started here. Now, I, I, I'll, I'll pull up the Video Master one first, just to kind of show you what this is for. Um, if you already have stems that are meant for the specific speaker locations, i.e. front left, front right, uh, LFE, center, left surround, right surround, that's what this is going to build. So this is effectively going to build a, a six-channel session. If I go ahead and click OK on this, you'll see that it defaults to uh, 48K, the video standard, 24-bit, uh, 5.1 master. If I click OK on this, it's just going to give you a blank session. And inside the session, it effectively has left front, right front, center sub, exactly everything I just said, with all of the associated pan um, positions already done for these. So the idea with this is someone gives you a bunch of stems and maybe you want to do some light mastering, or again, you're going to build that interleaved file, right? These are all mono stems. You can do that from here. And if I were to click on the surround panel here, you can see that for left front, this has all the audio confined specifically to the left front speaker, right? Open up the right front, same thing. Everything's contained in the right front. So this is assuming, again, that you've already, you've received a mix from Pro Tools, from Nuendo, from somewhere else, where they've already done all of the multi-channel positioning. And these are just those mono stems. What's nice about Audition is you can create the interleaved file, and then you can do some mastering on that after the fact, which I'll show you too. So that's what you do if you choose that surround for video template, all right? That's not what you would use if you want to do a fresh surround mix from scratch, okay? So to do one from scratch, let's do that. We're going to go into new multi-track session. And we're not going to choose a template. And instead, we're just simply going to choose our sample rate. Now, because this was tied to video, I will choose 48K. For bit depth, always work in 32-bit float. That's Audition's native working bit depth. That's Premiere Pro's native working audio bit depth. That's just where you want to be. And then for your master, here's where you actually can choose 5.1. So let's go ahead and choose 5.1, click OK on this, and it now builds a session. And you'll know that it's multi-channel because on every track, you'll have that surround panner. And from there, now you can begin dragging in your audio. So again, this is, uh, it doesn't matter what I'm actually dragging. And these were all mono stems exported from a, a stereo mix because I wanted to rebuild it and surround. So if I were to take this lightning track, oh, this is actually stereo, okay. And these are stereo tracks, that's fine. Uh, so here we see I have lightning, I have some screams, you know, um, let's see what else we got here. We have our tremolo strings, okay. And uh, there's all different kinds of random, random audio files in here that were extracted. Okay, and then I can drag all of these tracks into here. And then as I play these, we could open up our panner. And now if we wanted to do just static positioning of these, I could adjust the pan. Now what's really nice about this, hold on, I'm just going to loop this little section here. Uh, your levels panel down below here. This is going to allow you to see uh, everything across your six channels, all right? Now, for whatever reason, I don't know why we don't have those labeled, to be honest with you. It really should, they should be labeled along the edge because you don't really know exactly what's what here. Um, it's easy enough to figure out because you could take something like these lightning files and say LFE only and uh, it's gonna show you uh, if, any, if anything is going to the LFE, which at present it is not. So that fourth channel there, that's the LFE. Now you're not hearing that over the stream because I'm only sending 
stereo. I'm not sending a, um, a folded down mix through the stream. But this is now showing you that we've got discrete going to that LFE channel, all right? And if we were to disable LFE only, LFE only, then we have additional control for center, radius, spread, sub, etc. okay? All right, so you've got multi-channel metering to ensure that you know where things are going. So once that's done, that's it. Now you can actually begin doing the mix. So how do you do the mix? Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, go back to that one that has all of our stems. And let me just play this for you real quickly, just so you can hear the audio. Nothing special, it's just in stereo, all right? It's already got all the effects and everything mixed in here as well. And if I bring the video panel up, some of the clips are um, uh, unlinked. It doesn't matter for this, but just take a quick listen, okay? Here we go. I'm gonna put headphones on as well, I think. Okay, all right. So that's that's what it sounds like in stereo. And of course, all that came through because everything is just kind of mixed as it was coming from those original stereo stems or mono stems, whatever their configuration, okay? So if we wanna start mixing this and automating some of the movement, here's how we're going to do that. So perhaps just for today's stream to keep it kind of short, I'm going to focus on some of the tracks that have kind of continuous audio, which in this case are some of the ambience and um, sort of sound design around the lightning and thunder. So if you just take a look here, you can see that, well, first and foremost, throughout this entire track, we have this storm kind of permeating through the entire thing. All right, it's like light rainstorm. Put on my headphones so I can hear this. Right. It's really quiet. I don't know if that's coming through the stream here. Let me pump this up so you can hear it a little bit more. Now, something like this, again, in surround, you can get a little creative here. So if we open up the surround panner, currently, and this is something that you, this is a, this is a, a good practice if you're gonna be working with our surround panner. By default, this is the default positioning uh, when you bring tracks in. And what you can see is that it's equally, well, this is a stereo track, so it's going to the left and right, however it was mixed. However, by default, it's also going to the center at 100%. I Frankly, I don't know actually why we set that as the default because typically what do you want in the center? You want vocals, you want perhaps very specific sound design elements, but you don't want something like this rainstorm occupying the left, right, and the center. One, that's going to give you, that's going to um, minimize the stereo image because you have all this loud program material sum to mono through a single speaker, right? Center channel is a mono speaker. Um, but again, you're also, you're not leaving room for things that really belong there, like vocals, like dialogue, like other things. So one of the first things that I will often do when I go in here is remove this from the center. And if we were to play this back, again, taking note of the meters down here, I'm simply going to pull this out of that center channel. And that that's occupying that third meter that you see down there, a third from the top, all right? And now there's nothing going down there. You can also see that there's some of it going to the left surround and right surround. Now that's okay. Now again, if we wanna kinda of keep this static because this is going through the entire track, you know, maybe we widen this a little bit. Maybe we change it. Maybe we only have a little bit going to the front left and right and most of it going to the surrounds, okay? So you can see again, just by the meters here, We've got about a 20 decibel difference between what's going to the front left and right and what's going to the surround speakers because now we can get a little more creative with some of the additional sound design elements like this lightning, which is actually timed against elements in the picture. If you take a listen now. Okay. So you can see those are specifically added to match certain elements, right? Um, using our clip spotting feature right as they appear on screen, okay? 
So now what we have is we've got that constant rain largely in the surrounds, bleeding a little bit into the front left and right. That one doesn't necessarily want to move, but maybe we want the lightning to move. Now, as you can see here, that first bit of lightning is actually more on the right side, okay? The second bit of lightning here, I think it actually occurs more on the left, just coincidentally. That was, you can see we're using Adobe stock content here. So maybe we want it to originate from the, we'll start with this first one, from the right, but then kind of move over to the left. So you kind of get this kind of effect. Now you might say, well, why would you do that? Because you can, right? Why, why with Dolby Atmos do we have rain coming from, why do we have speakers from above? Because they could, right? <laughs> Sound design isn't necessarily there to mimic reality. It's there to grab your attention. Um, I'm one who actually likes it to mimic reality. So I'm all good with stereo to be completely honest with you. But, um, you can get creative with this because it does create a little more tension, a little more movement, a little more on the edge of your seat kind of a feeling. And I still, you know, for what, for all that it's worth, I like having something in that right and right, right surround. And if it goes and kind of moves and dissipates off, there's just something nice about that feeling. Again, it's entirely up to you how you automate, but this will give you the idea of how easy it is to do that. So if we go ahead and select our lightning track here, and we're gonna start, I want it to start kind of like this, all right? So if we were to just play this back right now, get those of you listening on Facebook and YouTube, you'll hear that it's primarily on the right side. Now maybe that's even a little too much. All right, let me wind that back a bit. Also wanna make sure that none of that is in the center. Pull that out, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this to the edge right before it begins. And down here in the track header, this is where we have our automation settings. Same automation settings that you've got in Premiere Pro. So you're always in read mode by default. We're gonna go into write mode. And then what that does is anything that we do, any parameter that we change, whether we independently change the angle and the radius, or I simply grab our little center orb here and drag it as it's playing back, it's going to record and track all of those automation points for me automatically. So what I'll do is I'll start with this first one and go left, uh, right to left. And then when it gets to the second one, I'm going to do the reverse left to right. All right. So let's go ahead and play through this and uh, let's see what we got here. Here we go. Wind this back a little bit just to give myself a little bit more, a little bit more room. Now, again, I, it's okay if I'm not hundred percent accurate on the movement, we can edit it after the fact. All right, here we go. this third one as well. All right. And that third one just kind of, it just kind of overtakes all of the speakers. All right. So if you were listening to this in 5.1, um, you've got this really dramatic sounding lightning. Right. Too dramatic? Maybe. Just trying to show you how it works. Okay. Now, if we want to see our work, see what we've done, next to the automation settings, you have this little triangle, this little flyout menu here. And if we twirl this down, now we have the ability to show envelopes. And you can see wherever you see an asterisk, that's telling you the parameters that we've modified. So all the parameters of this track panner can be automated. And if you take a closer look here, you'll see that the blue line this is the pan angle. So this is the, you know, the effectively the, the degrees left and right here. And then the radius is moving radially across the entire 5.1 field. So the blue is the pan angle and the pink is the pan radius. And then if you hover over the keyframes, I'll zoom in so you can see the values, um, you can actually see the specific values here, okay? So now if we wanted to modify this, we can. Let me just wind this back and you'll see that our lightning will now play. In fact, here, let me go ahead and just put this into read mode. It will play back our automation as it happens. Here we go. OK, 
okay? Really simple, right? Very, very easy. Okay, hold on one second. I'm just going to, uh, what's going on with my periscope here? Okay, looks like it's better now. Okay, so again, if I wanted to simply come in here and modify some of the parameters here, I just want you to take a look. As I scrub through this, okay, you have total editability of those. And you'll see that as I grab those keyframes, it's now changing the angle, right, based on what we've set on screen here. So all of these can be modified independently. Now, this is also another case where you want to use something called um, automation, what is it, linear, linear thinning. So let me go into the, I think it's under multi-track. I always forget what this is. Yeah, linear edit point thing and minimum time interval thinning. So very wordy. So these two settings are essential if you're going to be recording automation because as you can imagine, at 48K, 48,000 samples per second, 24 frames per second, if we were simply moving something, you're gonna have a lot of keyframes there. So you want this, I believe both of these are checked by default. You want those keyframes to be thinned because I don't want so many keyframes in there. Otherwise, it's impossible to edit them manually, all right? Now, the minimal time interval thinning, what that means is basically now, and I think the default is 200 milliseconds. I have mine set to 350. You won't get a keyframe unless it exists at a minimum of 350 milliseconds, right? So the nice thing about that is, again, the lower this value, the more keyframes you're going to have in a simple movement. The higher this value, the fewer keyframes. What's the, what's the ideal value? Well, it, it kind of just depends. I, I like around 350. That tends to, um, that tends to suffice and kind of give me enough without giving me too many. Okay. So again, if we wanted to move uh, an element of the radius here, you can see what that's doing as I'm moving this single keyframe, all right, real simply, okay? So it's really easy to come back in here and modify. Now again, let's say, all right, we d we've done that. We like those. Maybe we want just a little bit of the center channel to be filled with this last one that overtook all the speakers there for whatever reason. Well, again, uh, we would have been in uh, uh, touch mode. That's, that's where it goes after you, um, you finish doing a write mode. Incidentally, just real briefly, write mode, writes and overwrites. So if we were to go into write mode and wind back, it will record over all of the keyframed automation that we just did. Touch, which is what happens after you do a write pass, allows you to modify movement so you can touch and move something, but then it's going to uh, revert back to the last state wherever you left it. In fact, that's another one of those parameters up here, if I just pull this back again, uh, which we refer to as auto match time. By the way, these settings are also in Premiere Pro, all right? So after I make a change, it takes approximately one second for that keyframe to move back to wherever the last state it was in, okay? So that's, that's uh, touch mode, and then latch mode is if you've done a right pass, but now you wanna do a couple of little tweaks, it will latch to your position. So it's not going to overwrite anything until you move something. But if you move a keyframe, it's going to stay there, okay? So write, touch, and latch. That's the difference between those three. So in this case, I don't have any center channel keyframes. I wanna do this for the first time. So once again, I'll, I'll wind this back, hit play, and now when I adjust center, I'm just going to add a little bit to the center. Or maybe we add a little bit to the LFE as well. <laughs> Right, some really big rumble. Maybe we'll do that first. Here we go. Let's do that. Okay. Suddenly, if you were in the theater, you'd get this. But in fact, I'm getting it on my sub right here. Okay. Let's wind back again. All right. And let's do a little bit of center. Oops, I didn't grab it. Sorry. It's going to. Uh touch mode. All right, do it again. I don't I was in read. Sorry, so we didn't record the LFA. Here we go. Touch. Right. LFA moving and let's do the same for center. 
all right? So now again, just, just by rewinding this, you can see how those, these little sliders are moving, showing me the automation that we just created. And if I want to see them visually or make changes to them, now I can say, all right, show me the envelopes for center and LFE. And because now we've modified those, now we get the asterisks, okay? Showing us that we've made a change. So if we look at the LFE, right? Here it is. And again, because of that linear uh, edit point thinning and minimum time interval, this is perfect, right? Six little keyframes to create this motion. Uh, frankly, we probably could have done it in, in four, but um, again, this gives us a little bit more of that kind of bell-like curve so we can modify this more accurately, right? As that thunder happens, you're actually getting a nice little rumble of that thunder directly to the sub. That's actually perfectly timed. And if we go ahead and turn on the center one, there's the center one in green. So maybe we want that one, it, it dissipated a little bit, a little bit slower. Maybe we want just a little bit of the center right there. And there's the peak right about here, okay? And it just real quickly, it'd be very strange to have that in the center speaker, but it's sound design. So it would kind of cause you to jump a little because suddenly you're gonna have all this additional amplitude coming out right at your face, all right? So, automating and editing the keyframes of your automation and doing it right on screen. Now, by the way, if you simply want to keyframe them and you never want to touch the panner, you could do that as well. That's going to be a lot more difficult because as you noticed, especially with moving things around, it actually, by grabbing the orb in the center of that panner, it moves multiple things simultaneously. So I typically will recommend doing that first. Incidentally, just as we have the option to click on LFE only and it takes it away from all the other speakers, you can also disable specific speakers per pan or per track so you can ensure that it never goes there, okay? Which is actually really a, a, a very nice feature as well, okay? Very cool. Okay, so that's a little bit on the panning, the automation, and working with our 5.1 mix. So let me do this real quickly. What I wanna do is go over to my uh, kick drum sample here. So this all begins with a timed kick. We're gonna pull that out of the center. I don't want any kick drum in the center. We'll leave that in left and right where it's meant to be. I don't need any of it in the surround channels either. All right, it doesn't look like any of it's really going there, but we could also just disable these to ensure that. I'll turn that off as well. But maybe we have a nice portion of that going to the LFE as well. It is, after all, a kick drum. There's a lot of sub, well, there's some sub frequency in there. How much? Well, we can, we can see by looking at our frequency analysis here. So when I was kind of picking the kick, You can really actually get a really good sense of it. This orange line representing our sub channel here, right? It's actually got a lot of uh, sort of resonance at around mm, 80 hertz, not uncommon for a kick drum. But if we look right here, kind of our secondary peak, that's right around that's right around 40 hertz. Actually, I'm looking at the frequency right here right around 40 hertz. So that's some nice sub frequency right there with a very fast decay. So you can see it doesn't linger. It's not like it's and that's what kind of gives you that heartbeat, super tight, punchy kind of feeling, all right? So we can see we've got content going to the LFE. All right, Real nice, okay. And maybe we'll take a couple of these, and I want to place a couple of these screams and things into the, um, into the, make sure that they're in the center. Now what I would also do, because remember, everything here by default is already going to the center, I would pull a lot of this stuff out. So these screams, you know, I probably minimize how much of them are going to the left and right uh, and really focus more on the center. But I'm just doing this now so that we have some content that is specifically going there. So here, I'm just gonna quickly go through this, all right, and take a lot of the stuff that doesn't need to be in the center channel out of the center channel, all right? So you can imagine, again, if you've got a very big session here, this could, t this could take a minute, all right? 
Oh, sorry, I don't want to color that. Okay, just going to pull this out because we're going to do a quick little interleaved mix, and then I'll show you how you can do some very brief mastering on this. All right, and then I'll take some questions, and then I will send you on your way. Okay, these tremolo strings don't need that in the center. These crossfade strings. Oh, by the way, you know I could also do this a bit more easily here directly from the mixer view. You can see a perfectly laid out session, audio one through 20. Good job. <laughs> this was converted from something older, so the, for whatever reason, I don't know why these weren't named. Typically they would be named. I'm not that bad, I promise. All right, so that's enough. I don't have to do everything here, okay? And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty good here. Let's just take a look at what the metering looks like. Okay, now hold on. That, whatever that track was, I want that one to, uh, I want that to be in the center. It's these two. Okay, right now those are just going to the front left and right. So I want those to be 100% center. Actually, no, not 100% center, but mostly. Okay, nice. All right. Cool. Okay. So now that we've got our sort of basic 5.1 mix happening here, let's create the interleaved file, right? Now this is building for us a multi-channel wave uncompressed that houses all six channels together in one file. This is not creating stems. If we wanted to export stems, if we were sending this back to Premiere, or again, maybe sending this out to an external encoder, if you were to choose export to Premiere, this is where you have the option of how you'd like to mix it down. And you can see here that we can create stems, or we can mix it down to a mono file, a stereo file, or a 5.1 interleaved file. Well, in this case, we're going to do that interleaved file, which you can also do just by choosing mix down session to new file, entire session, right from the multi-track menu. Let's go ahead and do that. I think I've got everything the way I want it here. All right, mixes it down, and here we go. Pretty cool, right? And now in this view, this is now showing us our interleaved mix. Let me go ahead and save this. I'm gonna save it right on the desktop. I will call this live stream mix down dot wave. Note the attributes here, 48K, 5.1, 32-bit float, markers and other metadata, that's fine, that's the default, click OK. All right, and what you can see here now, there's, you know, again, amplitude-wise, there's not a heck of a lot discreetly going to the center because I just disabled most of that, except our sub thing is happening right about here, okay? You can also see what's going to the LFE channel, right? So these are all labeled once you open that interleaved file. And you can see the only thing really going here, oh, that's the, sorry, this is the thunder. This is the lightning bit. This is that little automated lightning bit that we did in the LFE. So right here, you've got this discreet thud. That's what that's gonna sound like, right? Rumble the room. But you've got discrete placement of those kick drums into the LFE, all right? And then here's showing you what's happening in the left surround, right surround. We've got this kind of just constant rain, atmospheric ambience going on. And a lot of stuff, a lot of unique stuff, different stuff happening between the left and right. Now what's really cool when you're working in this view is as I mentioned, you actually can master and tweak and apply effects to individual channels. So let's say in your monitoring environment, you have to have a 5.1 monitoring setup to really hear all this. I wanted to add some compression to the LFE. I wanna make that kick drum punch even more, all right? And I'm just, I'm just not, I'm just, but I don't wanna apply compression to everything. Like the mix is done, but I just want the LFE to be a little punchier, a little tighter. 
I can turn off all of these other channels. And if I simply highlight, in this case, the LFE, now I can apply a compressor, something like our tube modeled compressor, specifically to this channel if I wanted to. Or if, for the, if I wanted to do, let's say, a global edit, let's say I wanted to do just a very quick top and tail fading everything in because it actually starts at silence. So I want to just very, very quickly add a very, very short fade in to the very beginning. I can do that here with our non-destructive fade. And you can see that it will simultaneously affect all channels. Or if I additionally wanted to add any additional kinds of reverbs or things, or if I had some specific edits, maybe I wanted to apply some creepy delay effects to something in the left and right channels on this interleaved mix, or across all the channels, like a delay. <laughs> all right, something like that. Let's go over here to delay. All right, just do something kind of nutty right here. Uh, we'll make this kind of long. All right, Let's see how this sounds. A little bit of feedback, a little bit of trash. All right. And what do you see there? You see that I just applied effects specifically to that frequency range on that particular track. So when we play this back now, listen. <laughs> we just added this weird <sighs> delay just to those specific mid-range frequencies um, across all channels though, all right? There's nothing happening here. You can see a little bit happening in the center. Nothing, nothing uh, echoing down here in our, in our surrounds. So you have a lot of processing options here. And then of course, once we save this, it just saves those changes directly. So if we were to look at this file on the desktop, let's kind of do our get info here, all right? This is now showing you, right, that this is 30 seconds, six channels, 48K, 32-bit samples, okay? Real simple real easy. All right. Now, again, if we wanted to at this point, we could send this to Premiere. We could send this to an external third party uh, multi-channel encoder. All right. Um, you have lots of options here. But this is the nice way of doing some little post mastering. Oh, and additionally, let's say something else. This is actually really worth pointing out. Let's say you've got your LFE or your center channel. And your whole mix is great, but the center, it's just, it's just not loud enough for whatever reason. They didn't mix the center channels loud enough. Well, with the center channel discreetly selected, I can even do this with our little on-clip volume control here. I can just apply amplitude just to the center channel, all right? Or similarly, I can apply amplitude just to the sub-channel, right? Now, that's way too much sub. Remember, sub, you got to be... Always less is more with sub in a 5.1 mix because it can overtake everything. You gotta be really, really careful and you have to have a good listening environment. But you can see I'm only amplifying the sub channel here, not amplifying everything else. So this is a great way after the fact of like just doing subtle tweaking um, to your final mix. And then of course you could do additional mastering to this if you want. I'd probably recommend, you know, um, and it's really, it's changed a lot in the last couple of years the way that we um, master for multi-channel. This is one of the few instances where you don't want everything to just be loud and slammed in your face. You want, you want dynamics. You know, you have six speakers to work with. If everything is just loud, what's the point? Really, what's, what's the point? It's just, you're not going to perceive any, it, it's just, I don't know, maybe you will. It's, it, it, when it's more dynamic and there's actually change and amplitude, um, that's what, that's what engages you more. If it's just constantly loud across six channels, you know, it's less, it's less interesting to me. Additionally, you also don't want everything the same level like in your LFE in your center as they would be in your front left and right. And particularly, you don't want everything super loud in your surround channels, your rear channels. It's just going to be too much. So again, you've got independent control over that if you so desire. All right, cool. Well, let's go ahead and uh, take a couple of questions here. See if there are any. Start over here with uh, Periscope. Jordalac. 
Jordia Casa, nice to see you. Kyle, hey Desiree, Calzada, Dobler, MCD, all right. I don't see any questions over there on Periscope. What's up, Stan Arthur, Lior, Vahan, Keith Owen, dope setup, thank you, man. Victoria, no holds barred, hiya. Fabiano from Brazil. All right, Arturo, how's it going, Firas? Okay, Austin Lawrence, what is the best way for me to share my audio from a Premiere project to, say, a sound designer or mixer when I'm working on a larger project through the cloud? Um, well, if they're staying in, um, if they're staying in CC, in other words, they're going to be using Premiere or Audition. Um, I mean, the best way to share the files themselves. Um, I'm not. Maybe I need a little more information. Um, you know, you obviously, if you're if you're if someone's going to be tweaking your master mix, you want to make sure that you export your session out of Premiere. Um, you know, with uncompressed wave. Now, having said that, if you're gonna share that project, one way that you can do it, and here, maybe I'll open up Premiere real quickly to show you that, is you can, you know, there's a function to uh, send your entire Premiere timeline to Audition. Now, typically you create that by using a dynamic linked video. So it'll send all the video from Premiere non-destructively to Audition, and it maintains kind of its live thing. So if you're on the same machine, same everything, you know, you can make a color tweak in Premiere as you're editing sound, and the color tweak is referenced on the video in Audition. You also have the option to create a preview video, so it'll actually embed a rendered video. If you're going to be sharing and it's going to be someone externally, that's probably the best way to do it. Now, if they're going to be sending something back to you, as I showed you before, you can export stems, which will be full duration waves of the entire length of your edit, but each track, including buses and the master, if you desire, will have all the associated effects on them, you know, baked in. Or you could do something like an OMF. Um, we don't currently have AAF export out of Audition, but the OMF is very good. Um, and you could also theoretically do XML, although that gets a little trickier. So again, if it's going to be, if you're going to be staying in CC, it's pretty easy to do um, via the edit sequence in function. Or you could do a um, consolidate and transcode if you wanted, but then that that person's going to have a lot of smaller video files to deal with as opposed to just the audio. Um, or you could just export, again, kind of in a raw and rough way, export stems of the audio out of Premiere, render a really small little preview MP4, and upload it, whether it's on CC files or Dropbox or Google Drive, wherever you store your things. Um, just, to, just kind of depends how you like to work there, all right? Uh, okay, Michelle. Okay, you have a question um, on your you mix your YouTube videos for stereo. I saw one of them last night on a friend's TV with surround sound, and it did not sound its best. Is there any way to adjust for this? Um, so you're saying you saw you saw a stereo video on someone's surround system, and it didn't sound its best. Well, okay, so that's a great question, Michelle. I actually get this a lot. So you know, it depends on if someone has a lot of the. And it depends on the setup and how they're actually playing surround and what it's going through. If they're using sort of like a um, any kind of encoder or tabletop receiver that's doing some kind of decode of that surround signal, a lot of times it applies, um, or for that matter, it's expecting stereo, so then it applies its own surround effect. And typically when it does that, what happens is the center channel information sort of drops down, it attenuates, because it's trying to add reverb and ambient effects to fill all the channels. So yes, it's it's not going to sound as designed. Frankly, there's no way there's no way to fix or account for that because there's so many different variants that people can have if they're upmixing or trying to uh, reversion on a on a box stereo for five one. All right. Now there's things that you could do. Uh, effectively in your stereo mix to ensure sort of um, better, more focused sound. And really, the key there is if you want to make sure that everything stays very intelligible, very clear and present, always do a check for mono on your mix. Um, if it doesn't sound good in mono, it's going to sound really crappy if it's upversioned for a 5.1 playout when it was never intended to be played that way. And that goes the same for just playing back stereo. I just had a customer just the other day talk about publishing some stuff to 
some random Android devices. And I'm, I'm curious, and I've heard this from several customers on all iOS devices, fine, iPad, fine. Desktop machines, fine. Android devices, whatever their player was, I've heard this from three customers now, they were losing the center channel. They were losing info that was pan center. It was the stereo file. So you just you, you should always check for mono. And here I'll just show you where where you can do that real quickly. In Auditions Mixer, we make that really easy for you. Uh, you can check on individual tracks. That's not as useful. Um, you have this sum to mono icon right here. All right. But more importantly, you want to hear what the whole mix sounds like. Um, you can also apply something like a channel mixer effect to do that as well. Um, it's always a good idea, and especially you know if you're in a sort of proper mixing environment, like I have a separate speaker here that funnels everything through just a single channel. That's really the best way to ensure that you're going to get sort of compatible playback. But yeah, no, I hear you, Michelle. It's, it's rough. I've been there too, so it's difficult to, um, to account for that. Stan Arthur, what amplifier am I using in the studio? Actually, so yeah, I'm, uh, so I'm using amplified speakers. So I've got the, uh, I already forgot what, are these the HS10s? These are the Yamaha, the new 2019, I don't know what year these came out, 2016, versions of the NS10M with the, I think it's the HS8 sub. So it's powered sub, powered near field monitors. Um, they're they're preamplified. See, I don't have a standalone uh, amplifier anymore. What's up, Terry White? How you doing, man? Terry White just back from Photoshop World. I know many of you were there, so lots of tweets about that. Hope you got to catch Terry during the opening keynote and some of his sessions. Okay, Liam Sloan. Why was SoundCloud taken out of the previous versions of Audition, and is it possible to have it put back in? <laughs> Yes, that was a really awesome thing. We did have a share direct to SoundCloud. Um, I don't know why it was taken out, Liam, unfortunately. Um, yeah, there's no way to put it back in. That sucks. Uh, it was just cool to be able to publish directly. I know it's, you know, um, and I can put it in the chat here in Facebook. I know that's a question that we get asked, and you can, of course, vote via user voice to vote that functionality back up. All right, so let me track... Uh, over to YouTube here for some questions. What is up, Aunt Pruitt? <laughs> uh, you're so kind, sir. How's it going, ma'am? Uh, Jay Yunta, does it make sense to use stereo tracks when making 5.1 mixes? So that's a great question. You know, it, so again, it just depends. Um, so sure, why not? Not everything needs to be mono. For instance, if you have, you know, music in your film, whatever, as, you know, background music, underscore, whatever, it's already stereo, right? So sure, you're going to have that as a stereo file in a stereo track playing primarily in the left and right. You do not want, you know, background music going to the center. Maybe you have some of it going to the sub, right? So add a little bit of the kick drum. Although typically for movies, you don't have so much of that incidental music going to, a, to the sub, really, because we use that more for effects and sound design. Although you can, that's entirely up to you. And then maybe you either add our surround reverb effect just to add a little bit of ambient sparkle of that music to the rear channels, um, or really you just keep it focused left and right. You know, like I said, I for my money, really where the surround channels matter is in sound design. Really outside of that, I, I, I want to hear stuff front, center, left and right, you know, and the occasional LFE to give me that rumble in your chair kind of feeling. So yeah, it totally makes sense to use stereo tracks. But if you have mono elements, you know, something like, uh, you know, it could be an individual sound that you're using as part of sound design, or it could be maybe a solo violin that's very critical in a scene that you recorded in mono. Sure, you can have it as a mono track, as a mono file, and then you can move it, have it populate left and right. You could add delay and stereo effects to give it a more stereo kind of sound field or add our surround reverb to really put it in a multi-channel spherical kind of space. It's entirely up to you, but totally legit to do that. Joe Rees, oh, that's very kind. Thank you very much for the kind comment. Paul Fisher Media, you are also very, very kind. Thank you so much. I'm really glad you're learning a lot. Oh, and the mastering tutorials, that's really great. <laughs> Uh, being able to undo volume changes or effects changes. I often get frustrated changing something and I can't undo it. Yes, and that's actually been indicated. So what he's talking about, friends, is when you, um, 
make a change to track volume, it is not an it's not an undoable parameter. So I just change this to minus seven dot two. Um, but if I look back at my undo history, the last thing I can undo are keyframes. So again, here I'm going to put this. I'm going to put this in both chats, in Facebook and in YouTube. Our uh, user voice. Oh, hold on. I have to get this from another browser. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, our user voice forum. So if you go to this user voice forum and you can search by product, you can vote up features that you want to see in future versions of Premiere, Audition, After Effects, Character Animator, anything, Premiere Rush. Um, and this is in fact, this is not by the way, just some crappy forum where you just, people just post rants. No, this is, we want this. The more people that vote on it, the more people that vote it up, the higher the likelihood of those things coming in. And you can actually see, I believe there's some kind of a visual indicator that shows you for instance, what features just got added from user voice suggestions. So that's a really powerful way for you to interact directly, not only with product managers, because they search user voice every day, but the engineers, the people who work on the product, they go there to see, well, what do people want? And I'm with you, man. It should That should be an undoable parameter, changing volume, because I sometimes I'll knock the fader by accident or something. I don't have my uh, control surface here, but it happens, and then I'm, you know, you think, ah, oh, big deal, you moved it, put it back. Yeah, but when you get the mix just right and I accidentally knock a fader 20 dB, it's annoying, right? So I feel you. So yeah, that's the best way to vote it up. Okay, last couple of things here. You're very welcome, Thomas. What's up, Ramez, Tabshi? All right. Uh, Stan Arthur, oh, but what are they wired to for distribution? Ah, oh, yeah, so no, so out of my Focusrite Claret, that feeds, by design, the Yamaha is set up this way, that feeds the sub. The sub has the crossovers to then feed the near field monitors. So it it is basically the distribution system uh, that filters, and it has a, uh, a user controllable um, low frequency uh, uh, selector. So, you know, 120 hertz and above, if I only want you know, 80 hertz and above to go here. I think I have it set at 100. So 100 hertz and below goes to the sub or maybe 80, and then 80 and above goes to the near field monitors. And then of course you have um, separate uh, high pass, low pass frequency knobs on these monitors as well, okay? Actually, I think it's um, high frequency attenuation and mid frequency for room gain, all right? All right, Tom Normanly, how many FPS are you shooting? So this particular thing was done at 24 FPS, but you know, and that's that doesn't matter so much in terms of your multi-channel mix. You can do whatever you want there. All right. Hey Anissa, what's up? All right. Judazar, I love auditions. Is 7.1 mixing coming to the application? Okay. Again, I wish I could say it was, it were coming soon. User voice. Go in there. Search. I'm sure someone already has a topic in there and vote it up. And if you vote today, it starts moving up in the hierarchy and they can also search by most recently voted. Do that because I want to see that too. It's been far too long. And really, I mean, the truth is most things are still done legit in 5.1. Usually the 7.1 is just an add-on. You know how I was saying to Michelle's question before, stereo into, you know, sort of up 5.1 is just adding stereo effects to make it seem 5.1. A lot of 7-1 mixes are just that. Just like a lot of the films that are 3D are up, they're, they're converted 3D. They weren't shot 3D. <laughs> they just converted after the fact, you know? Not Avatar or something like that. That was designed and shot in 3D. But most films, they're, they're not shooting most of them in 3D. And you can see that in the credits, right? It's really common because some people love that. Me, barftastic, don't like it. All right, my friends, that's all the time I have for you today. So thank you so much for watching. We'll be back uh, tomorrow, either on the Premiere Pro or After Effects Facebook page. Got to think of a cool topic. If you want to hit me up for some topics that you'd like to see, hit me up at Twitter, at Beetlejace, or on Instagram, at Beetlejace. 
uh, let me know. You can also just comment in the chats here on YouTube and Facebook or on Twitter Periscope. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we will see you again next time. All right. Oh, and sorry, Tom was saying FPS of my stream. <laughs> Mad props for pronouncing your name correctly. Oh, thanks. Normally I screw those up. Yes. Uh, what is the FPS of the stream? It's 30. Yeah. Now Periscope may be slightly different. It's whatever their default is, but it's all defaults in Periscope, which is why the audio is also in mono. It's just their defaults. I think it's 96 kilobit audio. All right. Levon, thank you so much. Everybody, thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.